Once again, I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar. Using social media in research, regulatory and IRB considerations. I'm Ari Burgess, Forms Director of Client Relations. We're very excited to be discussing this topic with you today. It's one of many topics that we'll be presenting this year. I'll be giving you a brief overview of Quorum just before introducing our presenters. But first off, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. So questions and answers. Feel free to submit questions at any point during the webinar using the chat box that's on your webinar dashboard. If the time allows, we'll answer a few questions at the end of the webinar. The remaining questions and answers will be posted on our website. We'll be emailing you a link of, to view the questions and answers as soon as it's available. And a few more housekeeping items, the recording and the slide deck. The webinar recording and the slide deck will be posted to our website within five business days. We'll be emailing you a link to view the recording as soon as it's available. And go ahead and feel free to share this link with your staff and your colleagues. So now I'm just going to take a few minutes to talk briefly about Quorum Review and give you an overview of our organization. We are a fully accredited IRB, accredited by AHARP through 2014. We were recently re-accredited with a five-year accreditation. We're fully compliant with FDA and OHARP requirements. We're an international board in the sense that we, both, we review both U.S. and Canadian studies. We have approximately 180 employees, which makes us one of the largest IRBs in the United States. And I'm, I like to talk about the number of quorum staff that have CIP certification, the Certified IRB Professional Certification. 60% of our affiliated IRB members do have this certification, 40% of our regulatory staff, and 20% of our study management and study support positions. We're dedicated to this, or, to this certification and believe that it really improves the quality of service that we provide for our clients. Quorum has eight board meetings each week. I like to talk about our turnaround times because I think that they're pretty outstanding. We have a 24-hour site turnaround time, 36-hour amendment review turnaround time, and same-day site changes that are available. In an effort to minimize redundant information and submission of redundant information, we only require that CV and audit documentation be submitted once, and then we'll store it. We're committed to supporting both East Coast and West Coast clients, so we, are, we do have support available from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Time. All studies receive a dedicated study manager and have a single point of contact through the life of their study while it's with Quorum. As I mentioned, we do have a, con a convenient Canadian review. We're aware of how important these days uh, the electronic access is, so we have a secure portal with smart forms, a number of um, status reports and approval documents are all available online for printing for regulatory binders or storage. We're also aware that um, there are a number of different kinds of studies these days and that one kind of study process doesn't necessarily fit all. So we've developed both a customized phase one and post-marketing process. We're also flexible and, and offer flexible and customized process processes to support academic medical centers, your universities and hospitals. So uh, when they wish to work with a central IRB, we're, we're available for that as well. And as always, we know that quality is very, very important. So we have a 100% quality control check on all documents that go out of Quorum's doors. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and tell you a little bit about our presenters. We, we have two presenters that will be presenting this topic today, Mitchell Parrish and Claire Carberry. Mitchell joined Quorum Review in January 2010 as a regulatory attorney. Prior to joining Quorum's regulatory department, Mr. Parrish worked as a regulatory counsel for Western IRB and as a regulatory advisor to the National Cancer Institute's Central IRB. Mr. Parrish is CIP certified. Mr. Parrish earned his JD from the University of Oregon School of Law and is a member of the Washington State Bar Association. Additionally, Mr. Parrish is a member of the American Bar Association and the Health and Corporate Law sections of the WSBA. Claire Carberry joined Quorum Review in September of 2009 as a regulatory attorney. Prior to joining Quorum's regulatory department, Ms. Carberry worked as a regulatory analyst and legal intern at Western IRB. Ms. Carberry recently passed, passed her CFP and received her CFP certification as well. She currently serves as a member of, Northwest, of the Northwest Association for Biomedical Research and Public Responsibility in Medicine and Research. Ms. Carberry received her JD from Seattle University and is a member of Washington State Bar Association. 
In addition, Ms. Carberry is a member of the Health and Corporate Law Sections of the WSBA. So I'm now going to hand the time over to Mitchell so we can move into the topic and start talking about social media in research. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Mitchell Parrish. We're very excited to have you on the phone today. And again, we're going to be talking about using social media in research, regulatory and IRB considerations. Now, Quorum is very excited to talk about this topic because Quorum continually fields lots of questions about social media and continues to receive submissions for advertisements and recruitment and other communication materials that involve social media. It's also easy to see that social media is popular outside of Quorum. For example, if you did a Google search and typed in clinical research and social media, uh, an array of articles would pop up. Now, what's interesting to note about are these articles that you would find is that there's not really articles from the IRB perspective. And that's why Quorum wanted to take on this topic to make sure we could give the IRB perspective and provide helpful information with social media and how to work with the IRB when you are having social media reviewed. Now, one thing I also want to note is this presentation is based on uh, Quorum's interpretation. It's based on FDA and DHHS regulations. But because it is based somewhat on Quorum's interpretation as well, we do obviously know that there's going to be institutions, sponsors, and other sites that have their own policies on social media research. So obviously, if we received a submission from one of those entities, Quorum would make sure our policies and the policies from those entities are consistent prior to going forward with board review. Now today, the topics we're going to cover, first, I'm going to talk about a webinar overview, which basically I'm going to discuss why is it even important that we're talking about social media today. Next, I'm going to define social media. And then we're going to move on to our three major topics. The first one is going to be social media and recruitment, which I will cover. And then Ms. Carberry will cover the next two topics, which are social media, technology, and communications. And finally, communicating study results via social media. Hold on one moment while I try to advance the slides here. Okay, I apologize for that moment interruption. We now have our slides back and working. So first, why do we even need to discuss using social media in research? So social media is being viewed as an increasingly popular and effective tool for recruitment and for communications during research. There is a trend in using social media, and this trend is not going to go away. It's only, only going to increase. So it's important now to really uh, have our policies in order and understand how to work with social media, and especially working with social media in terms of IRB review. The next point is the FDA and OHARP have not yet produced any guidance on the use of social media. The interesting thing to note here is the FDA's Division of Drug Marketing, Advertising, and Communications was indeed supposed to release draft guidance on the Internet and social media by the end of 2010. Then it got delayed, so it was supposed to be released by the first quarter of 2011. Now, as of March 30, 2011, the end of that first quarter, the FDA still did not produce its guidance. Nonetheless, there is indication that the FDA remains committing to producing such a guidance. However, even if the FDA does produce such a guidance, this guidance is really talking about social media and advertising for the promotion of FDA-regulated products, not necessarily relating to IRB review and social media. So even if there is this guidance produced by the FDA, it's unlikely that that will unravel any issues relating to the review of social media and IRB review. So first, let's actually define social media. This word gets used a lot. What does it actually mean? So one definition is, social media is an internet-based mode of communication that allows users to interact with the medium, typically a website, and or other users of the media. And this term encompasses a broad variety of things. For example, the term includes social networking, like Facebook, Twitter, MySpace, LinkedIn, it also includes social photo and video sharing, for example, Shutterfly and YouTube. And finally, there are interactive websites, for example, blogs. 
So first I want to talk about blogs. This is not always something that's considered with social media, but can be important in terms of um, an IRB needing to review a certain blog depending on the content that it contains. A blog is an online journal or chronicle updated on a regular basis, which can be published by any individual or company. Now, these blogs can have subject recruitment and advertising because, for example, you can have a blog that's uh, directed or discusses new clinical trials for, for example, persons suffering from leukemia. And on that blog, it can have direct advertisement information, including where to join, you know, what the compensation is, things of that nature. So blogs can be a, a way that social media is used to recruit subjects. And also one important thing to note about blogs is that they can seem very personal and targeted because you have a captivated audience. People who are going to be reading a blog about, for example, leukemia may actually have that disease, so they're going to be a more captivated audience. Next, also in the social media realm, we have podcasts. A podcast is a recording of an audio or video broadcast created for downloading onto a digital player for playback. Now, podcasts are interesting because you can have, for example, an investigator who's talking about a clinical trial that he or she is involved in, and that can be recorded. And then this recording, sort of an advertisement for the clinical trial, can be uploaded to various devices like an iPod or an iPhone or onto someone's computer. Next, in the social media realm, there's also mobile technology. This wouldn't traditionally be considered social media, but we do find that certain things like communicating study reminders or communicating information about a study via text messaging is becoming more prevalent, and so we did want to discuss that today. These various technologies that are used for communications during a study, um, we are going to discuss that today, and Ms. Carver will be handling that. So our first main topic. Social media and recruitment, regulatory and IRB considerations. Now, <clears throat> I think we all know that recruiting activities are the beginning of the informed consent process. Because they are the beginning of the informed consent process, it is required that this advertising and recruitment be reviewed by the IRB. There are the FDA and applicable DHHS regulations that tell us this, but more importantly, what makes the IRB directly know that it has to review this information is the FDA information sheet titled Recruiting Study Subjects. While this guidance was written for print advertisements and really social media wasn't contemplated at the time, we still find it very helpful in looking to when reviewing social media. Also applicable is the FDA information sheet, a guide to informed consent. Now I'm going to be talking about these two guidance documents quite a bit, but Keep in mind that even if you have a study that's not under the FDA regulations, it's only under the DHHS regulations, the FDA information sheet can still provide helpful information because, again, FDA and DHHS regulations do often mirror one another. So based on this FDA guidance, recruiting study subjects, the IRB really knows what it's looking for when it actually does receive advertising or recruitment via social media. And based on that guidance, we're going to apply those same principles that we do to print ads to social media ads. For example, when we receive an ad used via social media, the IRB and the board is going to make sure that that language in the advertisement is not unduly coercive or the more common term, unduly influential. Also, the board is going to look to make sure that social media advertising does not promise or imply a favorable outcome or other benefits beyond what is contained in the protocol. Or it's going to ensure that the advertisement doesn't communicate that the study product is safe or effective for the purposes under investigation. Also, always looking to make sure there's no claims that the study product is known to be equivalent or superior to any other study product. The board's going to make sure that the advertisement does not include language indicating the regulatory authorities such as the FDA and IRB have approved the research. And also, uh, one that the board is always looking for, we're going to review those text messages, those tweets, the, the ads that pop up on Facebook to make sure there's no therapeutic misconception. So typically with this, what the board's looking for are things such as the word treatment, because if the word treatment's used, a subject may get confused that they're entering something that may help them when really the main purpose of the study is to test an investigational drug. So if the word treatment is there, the board may look to that social media advertisement and replace the word, or else at least try to add language indicating what uh, is really met by treatment in the study context. 
Next, still considering that FDA guidance and applying those same principles to print ads with social media, the board is going to make sure that there's no promise or implying a free medical treatment. It's going to make sure that payment language is not emphasized. And finally, the board is going to ensure there's just that information that needs to there in order to have subjects determine their interest and also that there are no general misleading statements. So the FDA guidance is still very relevant in terms of what to actually look for when reviewing advertising and recruitment via social media. So the question really becomes, what actual social media advertising recruiting requires review? Again, I'm going to turn to the FDA guidance on recruiting study subjects. That document does have a section that talks about what does not require review. And what it says is communications intended to be seen or heard by health professionals, news stories, and also publicity intended for other audiences. So applying this to social media, if there's a, you know, a few doctors have Facebook pages and they're discussing information related to a clinical trial, obviously this is doctor-to-doctor uh, -doctor communication, would not require review. Let's say there's a blog, and on the blog someone posts a new story from the New York Times about an upcoming clinical trial or a new drug that's out there to treat, uh, that, that will hopefully treat pancreatic cancer. This is simply a news story that's taken from somewhere. This would not require review. And also, if there's any publicity intended for other audiences. So if there's information discussing a clinical trial to try to get investors excited about a drug, again, this information is not directed at potential subjects. It's not direct advertising, so it would not require review. That FDA guidance then goes on to say what actually does require review. And what it discusses is direct advertising for research subjects would require review. So let's take some of those same examples. So now we have a blog that doesn't just have a news story, for example, about a new drug for pancreatic cancer posted on it. Instead, it has a news story, but then it also talks about a specific trial that subjects can actually enroll in, and then it talks about compensation for that trial, how to get in touch with people for that trial, and really the intent of the blog is to attempt to recruit subjects. So there, the intent of the blog and the actual content that's on that blog would require review because it would be considered direct advertising. And of course the FDA guidance talks that about uh, recruiting of a radio, TV, bulletin boards, posters, flyers. Again, this is still relevant but somewhat outdated because now we also have, again, social network pages, websites, blogs, podcasts, tweets, all sorts of different things of that nature. So this is what the FDA guidance actually says. Now I want to take that a step further and try to provide even more information from the IRB's perspective about what may require review and what may not require review. So from the IRB's perspective, review generally is not required for, let's say, information about relevant research conducted outside of a study. So if there's other research that a subject can find online or obtain from somewhere, that would not require review. And again, this information can be obtained from blogs, Facebook, Twitter, or other social media mechanisms. Also, general tips and or resources containing information that is generally accessible on the internet. So again, this sort of relates to the FDA guidance and publicity, but if someone's able to go online, search for information about uh, any available trials for persons suffering from leukemia, and they find information about signs or symptoms, about where to look, uh, news articles, other sources that they really can find on their own that are just out there available on the internet, this would not require review. Again, I already mentioned general information about the disease that's publicly available would not require review, even if it's posted somewhere in a, some social media forum. Next, this is a really important one and also can be confusing to a lot of people. And what I want to note is that information pictures, videos, links, or other information posted by a research participant would not require review. So participants are free to essentially do as they want. They can share information, they can talk with other people, and so if you have a participant in a trial and they have their own Facebook page or their own website and they want to talk about a clinical trial that they're in or provide contact information about it or post general information that may seem like it could be actually be recruitment material, but they're just a person in the study, not someone actually involved with it, and that's their prerogative and they want to share that information, then that does not require IRB review. 
again, participants are free to um, you know, communicate what information they wish. Next, something that would not require review. Websites that contain only the following information. Study title, purpose of study, protocol summary, basic eligibility criteria, study site locations, and how to contact the study site for more information. And how we know that these websites uh, would not require review is direct guidance from OHARP. So OHARP's guidance on IRB review of clinical trial websites tells us that if a website only has this basic information, this does not require review. And a perfect example that we have of this is clinicaltrials.gov. So if you limit a blog post or a Facebook page or, or a tweet that only contains this information, it may not require review. So that, from the IRP perspective, is what may not require review. So now what does require review? Again, thinking back to that FDA guidance, direct advertising in any social media form would require review. This information is presentable in many different forms and can be found on search engines, websites, Facebook, blogs. I'm going to touch on a little bit of the ads that you can see online. So first, there's display or banner ads. So you can have on a Facebook page or on any website uh, advertisement that pops up at the top of the page or on the, the right side of that page. If that contains information um, that's involved in direct recruiting, for example, compensation information, information about how to get in touch with the study contact and specific things that may interest the subject, this ad that pops up, no matter where it pops up, would require review. Then to add the additional element, there could be rich media ads. So this is the same as a display or banner ad, but now you have advertisements at the top of the page or the side of a page. You can actually roll over it or click on it, and it'll provide more information, or it'll take you to another advertisement. Here, if there's a rich media ad, either the ad itself or wherever you click to could also require review, depending on the information contained in that advertisement. Also, there are paid search ads. So now people are purchasing keywords relevant to a research study. So if you're on a website and someone and there's a, someone types in a keyword, an advertisement or a, a link to an advertisement can pop up that talks about that clinical research. Here, it's not the keyword that's going to need IRB review. It's going to be whatever a person is clicking on in that advertisement that will require review. Along the same lines, there's in-text ads. So you can be reading an article about uh, available clinical trials for a person suffering from leukemia, and there can be the word clinical trial highlighted, and if someone clicks on it, it'll take them to an available clinical trial in that person's area. Again, it's not the highlighted word that's going to require review, but whatever information that pops up or that a subject links to, that's what is going to require review, again, depending on the content of what's contained in that ad. And then we come to social network ads. Here I'm talking about a social network page like Facebook or MySpace. If someone's on that page, um, an ad can pop up on that social network page. And what's really interesting here is these ads are very targeted because now there's cookie or, cookies or data mining. So someone can be out there and be looking at someone's Facebook page and understand that this person is sharing information about a certain topic, for example, leukemia or is seeking information about leukemia, so then the computer is going to know that this person may be a good candidate to receive an advertisement for a clinical trial for a new drug to help with leukemia. So it's, it's interesting now because there's a lot of very targetable information and also it, it raises the issue in terms of invasiveness of, on someone's Facebook page if they have targeted ads coming directly to their Facebook page. Facebook page. When I talk about social network pages, I'm talking about the ads that pop up on a social network page, but also you can have an entire social network page that is an advertisement into itself. For example, a social network page that's created for uh, a pancreatic cancer trial. So here, this page contains all sorts of information about the trial, um, can link people directly to information about the trial, can talk about eligibility criteria, and can also have a spot where people enter in information to determine if they're eligible. This whole page would require IRB review, and the IRB would look to those same FDA principles to make sure the website's acceptable, but now we also have to take it a step further. Since there could be this page that's collecting people's information, for example, the board's going to want to know, and the IRB's going to want to know, 
what's the access or privacy settings of the page? And is any protected health information being shared? And if so, what is that information and what happens to the information? Also, how do you make sure that the information that's provided uh, by someone on that Facebook page is actually confidential? Other things that the IRB would require review are blogs for a specific study containing direct advertising. There can be blog posts on any blog containing direct advertising. Again, tweets containing direct advertising or text containing direct advertising. So I talked about what the IRB is actually going to look at when it has a social media ad come before it. And it's going to look back to those same principles that it would consider now with print advertisements. Also, we have the more complicated issue of what actually requires review. Now I want to take a step further and consider other issues that may arise with social media advertising. So the first one is, it's been noted that sending promotional messages about a clinical trial without using the medium in ways typical of a common user, this could raise issues of spamming. For example, Facebook was created for people to interact with friends who know each other to share information. Now you may have someone that's logging on to a Facebook support page for a person suffering from breast cancer, for example, and is now attempting to recruit or provide information on that page. So they're not using that Facebook page as, a, as it was originally intended. They're using it as a recruitment mechanism. So is this too intrusive? Um, you know, is this simply spamming? Is this appropriate? This is something to consider and something um, the board may ponder as it reviews various advertisements. Next, we have those pages now that, and websites or social network pages that can collect people's personal health information to determine their eligibility, for example. So what does the IRB do with this? There's actually another FDA guidance that does provide some helpful information. That FDA guidance is the FDA information sheet recruiting study subjects. How this guidance was originally intended was if someone saw a print advertisement or a flyer and there's a phone number at the bottom, they would call that number, someone would answer who's related to the trial, and the person would on the phone would collect information from the caller to determine if they're eligible. Well, what the FDA guidance said in that instance is if that does happen, you want to make sure that um, the IRB needs to know where that information that's being recorded on the phone is going. Is it going to be destroyed if someone's not eligible? What's going to happen and is it going to be confidential? Well, we have those same exact issues. Now if someone has a Facebook page or a website and they're entering in their personal health, health information to determine eligibility, the IRB is going to have to consider what happens to that personal information that's being collected. Is it secure? Is it confidential? If someone is not eligible for the study, is that information still retained or is it destroyed? And also, there's other issues. Is that information going to be sold so other people looking for potential participants may want to purchase people that are interested to help their recruitment? The next thing to consider beyond simply what requires review is how do we go about actually reviewing social media campaigns and what's the timing of review look like? For example, let's say we have a whole campaign that has a Facebook page for the clinical trial for a condition, it has a related blog, it has a Twitter account, and there's automatic text messaging sent from account related to that. So with all this social media, there's going to be real-time communications, and that's why social media can be so effective. You're having up-to-date, real-time communications. But how does this work when an IRB has to approve everything initially? when you, maybe content of various ads haven't even been contemplated. Well, what we recommend is, in this instance, is really working with the IRB. So up front, you should have all your information that you've already prepared so that can be initially reviewed by the IRB. Additionally, if there's information that is not yet specifically written, like a blog entry or a tweet, provide an outline of what could be on that tweet or what could be on that blog. and provide parameters for what actually could be said. And with that whole plan of what, you know, what is already known and what is uh, already written and then what could be with those parameters, work with the IRB there to determine then how best to review all that information so you can keep that spontaneous real-time nature of the social media. For example, the IRB can then think about using expedited review 
or another mechanism to help really uh, have some expeditious review. Or possibly tweets or a blog post if you have that outline, if you have parameters, and if it's known that that essence of the message that's going to be communicated on that blog or tweet is what the IRB approved initially, then possibly further review would not be required. So I talked about social media and advertising recruitment. Uh, hopefully got some helpful information sort of about how Quorum looks at uh, social media and some of the issues that we've come up with and considered when addressing various issues with social media and advertising and recruitment. Some things I want you to take away with this part of the presentation are that there are numerous social media formats in which to recruit and advertise. But remember that it's the content of the recruitment that dictates whether IRB review is required. Also, there are going to be a lot of issues beyond typical print advertisements that require consideration. For example, how is the advertising conducted? If people are entering a page, uh, information on a Facebook page, what other considerations will the IRB have to go through? For example, privacy settings, things of that nature. Also, if there's uh, real-time communications that have not necessarily been written yet, how does that review work and what's the timing of review like? I really want to stress again with this, work with the IRB, determine the best way to conduct that review up front. Now I'm going to pass the rest of the presentation over to Ms. Carberry, who will first talk about social media, technology, and communications. Thank you, Mitchell. Um, that was a really interesting discussion of recruitment. I think that that is perhaps one of the more ambiguous and complicated pieces of what we're going to be talking about today. So it's really helpful to hear some of those examples laid out. And um, I would certainly echo Mitchell's um, recommendation in encouraging IRB's sponsors and investigators to think about how to review particularly recruitment um, in advance of trying to implement uh, the use of social media and other technology as part of recruitment. So I'm going to be talking today about the use of social media and other technology during the course of the study. Um, generally, these types of communications fall much more squarely within, I, and within um, an IRB's oversight. So um, whereas there may be some ambiguity about recruitment and what exactly requires review, um, it may be a little bit clearer during the course of a study communications with um, a participant, a subject, um, what, what exactly requires review. And I think that communications and policies that have been developed about communications during the study in our more traditional formats um, might easily apply in, um, in the social media and other technology types of settings. So getting back to the regulations, what do the FDA and OHARP say about communications to participants? And I've included the citations here on this slide um, for everyone's benefit, but we'll not read them off as I go through. Um, going sort of from broad to more specific, first, there's a, there's a point in the regulations that indicates the IRB has authority to approve or require modifications or disapprove all research activities covered by the regulations. Second, there's a reference to reviewing specific research activities as a function of the IRB. And finally, um, and from my perspective, the most important that the IRB must ensure that there are adequate provisions to protect privacy of subjects and to maintain the confidentiality of data. And certainly this becomes um, something of heightened concern when you're using social media and other technology um, as opposed to more traditional forms of communicating with individuals during a study. So as far as types of communications that we see, it, there's, there's a couple of main buckets here that I would, um, that I would call out. Um, the first is communications where you're soliciting information or there's some sort of interaction between the participant and um, the investigator that you're collecting information. So we see these as an online um, or phone-based diary. Perhaps people are using some sort of device to complete or send information, questionnaires, that sort of thing. Um, and then the other main bucket is reminders about appointments, taking drugs, um, and, and that sort of thing. And those can come through a variety of different media as well. Email, Facebook messages, textbook messages, we've seen all of that come through here. Um, and lastly, 
information about study progress, typically changes to the study, of course, are going to be uh, noted in the consent and you're going to have a reconsent process, but there might be information that um, is disseminated um, in, in a social media format or use of other technology in addition to that, or in cases where a reconsent wouldn't be required, but perhaps you're just providing an update. Um, you could also see that. So back to the question of when, when do these communications require review? And <laughs> of course, it depends. But um, some general rules. So reminders about a study, um, things like taking your drug or an appointment, may not require review. So for example, say you have a script for calling individuals and letting them know about um, a visit or something like that. It, it, it's a phone script. If that even were to exist, it's not something typically that an IRB would require review of. When you put that same reminder, the exact same content into technology, um, perhaps a text message, perhaps a message to someone through a Facebook account, um, you increase the privacy concern. And we get back to that responsibility of the IRB to ensure that adequate measures are in place to protect privacy and maintain confidentiality. Um, so the method of communication is something that may ultimately make that reminder, make that message to a participant require, um, make it subject to IRB review, whereas it may not be in other formats. Um, that's certainly something that you want to explore with the IRB that you're working with figure out what their policies are at the outset. No one wants to find out after the fact that um, something should have been reviewed and wasn't and was utilized. Typically, when we're looking at this other bucket of diaries, questionnaires, information that you're um, soliciting from subjects, those often require review, I would say, no matter what format they may be. And, and, and again, we have the issue of heightened privacy concerns, confidentiality concerns, when you are administering these tools in a, you know, not a paper format, so. So th the next issue becomes, so you, you've got something, your IRB, your IRB says, yes, you are going to have to submit this for our review because of the way that you're communicating it, because of the content that you're going to be communicating, and where should that be described? How do you communicate to the IRB how you're going to be sending out these communications? So, it, there's two sort of ways that we see this come in um, to IR, our IRB. The most common is when we see a, a sort of a large study with a lot of sites and the sponsor, CRO, has developed some sort of global plan. Um, it's going to be something that's utilized across all sites. Um, and in that case, it's, it, it seems to make it easiest if there's some reference to this either in the protocol or a, or a supplement or addendum to the protocol describing what the plan for communications during the study is. Um, something that's less common, we may see a site, an investigator perhaps utilizes social media or other technology with their patients and they would like to do that also with their subjects that are involved in studies. Um, and that should, pro you, it could be submitted at the outset or it also could be submitted at the time that an individual um, communication is submitted for review. So it's something that, again, you'd want to work on, at the site level with your IRB, the investigator should be in communication with the IRB to discuss how that's going to be submitted for review, what requires review, and, and so forth and so on. Lastly, um, the, the consent form is a piece that needs to be considered. As Mitchell mentioned, it could be seen, I think, by a lot of people by, as somewhat intrusive if they are unaware that they're going to be receiving a text message, for example, or a, or a Facebook message, um, if, to receive that about a study. And particularly if they're, it's something that they are not interested in, other people being aware of their disease status um, or their involvement in a study. So certainly it's something that we, we would always recommend that at the outset, if any of these types of communications are planned during a study, that um, prospective participants be advised of that in the consent form and that you provide enough detail so that they're aware of exactly how they're going to be contacted and communicated with. Um, 
it's something to consider is, and this is something that we see called out a lot in consent forms, is that there might be costs associated, for example, with a text message if someone's getting a text message reminder. And so that's something that participants are going to want to consider. Um, sometimes we've seen situations where they may be reimbursed for those costs, but those are things to consider before implementing um, the use of that kind of technology. Um, as I mentioned, there's arguably an increased risk to privacy, so uh, notifying individuals about the use of the technology and then advising them about um, that risk is important in the consent form. And lastly, um, this, this often we will see in a consent form is to consider whether an opt-out provision is appropriate. In some cases, it may be perfectly practical to allow people to opt out of being involved in, for example, text message reminder system, but in other cases, it might be, be problematic to not have a certain faction of your subjects um, filling out an online survey or something like that. So you may need people to be opting into this and not, not want to allow them to opt out as part of participation in the study. So the key takeaways with respect to communications during the course of the study with subjects is that the IRB may, might require review of communications via social media or other technologies where they wouldn't require that same review um, for using some of our more traditional methods of communication that we, we've seen. Um, and this goes back to the IRB's responsibility to assess risk to privacy. It's the chief concern when reviewing these communications. Um, and a description of the communication should address those risks and also the steps that are being taken to mitigate the risks. So what kind of controls are in place? How is the information controlled? Um, and that sort of thing um, should be addressed up front. So moving into um, communicating social media and study results is the next um, topic we're going to jump to, so kind of moving our way through the course of a study here. So we've certainly seen um, sponsors um, interested in using, utilizing social media to communicate study results. It's, a, um, it's an easy way to communicate to a broad group of people um, and certainly is, is something to consider as part of a, um, disseminating that, that type of information. Now if a study is still open while the results are communicated, open as um, under the jurisdiction of an IRB, then this would generally require review. So that's a pretty cut and dry, straightforward, um, straightforward aspect. It gets a little bit more complicated if the study is closed. Um, generally, of course, the IRB review might not be required, but there are exceptions to that. Um, three exceptions that we've identified here and, and are things that we like to look out for if we're asked whether um, the use of social media or technology or any dissemination of study results would require review are, um, there's three, three things here where we would, we would um, recommend that IRB review be obtained for a post-study uh, communication. So the first is if the reporting of the results, the dissemination of the results is being used as a recruitment tool. The second is if it appears to reinitiate study activity, and lastly, if HIPAA is implicated. So social media that appears to function as advertising or recruitment for a study, this could be perhaps an extension study, um, providing results about you know, the initial study and then providing information to people about an extension study and how, how they could enroll, how they might be, in, uh, if they're interested, who to contact. So that's something that potentially requires IRB review. Um, another, another piece of this is the reinitiation of study activity. IRB review may be required if, if study activity is reinitiated. So for an example here is a YouTube video that provides information that subjects are required to know um, for medical or regulatory reasons. That may be something that requires IRB review. Or a Facebook message to a participant that would provide study results, perhaps even individualized results, certainly you'd want to work with your IRB to determine whether that's something they would require review of. And lastly, um, if HIPAA is implicated, either an IRB or privacy board may need to review um, the dissemination of this information. As a general rule, when you're reporting general aggregate study results to subjects after the study is closed, HIPAA wouldn't be implicated and um, you wouldn't necessarily need IRB review of that, um, at, at least from a HIPAA perspective. However, 
if you are providing individual or identifiable information in any way, um, it may require further oversight. Something to keep in mind. So a key takeaway with respect to post-study um, communications is it may require IRB review depending on context and content of the message. So it's go back to those three different points. There may be other circumstances or scenarios where IRB review is required. So again, what we would encourage is that you communicate with your IRB, ask them whether they would require review, um, and go from there. So to sum up, the, um, that brings us to the end of our discussion of social media and research today. And um, to sum up our main points with today's presentation, in the absence of FDA OHARP guidance related to social media and research, we, our, our process here at least would be to look to existing regulations and guidance and try to apply those as best we can to this sort of new world that we're looking at. Um, and th the second main point that I think is just very important for the IRB, sponsors, CROs, investigators to work together to determine what requires review, how the IRB is going to conduct review, and the timing of review. Um, and as you're working with IRBs, certainly, uh, and IRB, as you're working with the IRBs, ask them about their policies, and as an IRB, it's important to think about the different scenarios that you might face as, as you see these campaigns coming through and um, develop policies and procedures so that um, you're comfortable in reviewing these types of, um, you know, the recruitment communications and post-study communications that you have some policies in place that you can work with. So that is the completion of our discussion, and now we are opening it up for questions and answers. I'm going to hand it over to Ari Burgess. Thank you. So we have had a lot of questions come in during our presentation. We're going to go ahead and take some time now to answer a few of them. So the first question that we're going to answer was, um, it was noted in the beginning of the presentation that the FDA may produce guidance on the internet and social media. What specifically is that guidance, guidance's focus? Mitchell? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. So the guidance appears to be focused on the promotion of FDA regulated medical products using the internet and social media. So this guidance could therefore certainly provide helpful information on advertising for clinical trials and IRB review, but is likely not directly on point because again it's for the promotion of uh, drug products and devices, not necessarily for um, IRB and IRB review. In addition to the FDA guidance in this area, it is also hoped though that the FDA and OHARP will issue new guidance for sponsors, researchers, and IRBs on the internet and social media and clinical advertising and recruiting. So we are hoping that there's going to be this initial guidance, but then also followed up with that, we're hoping there's going to be a guidance more specifically tailored to IRBs. The next question says, it seems like the use of technology is typically not described in protocols or consent forms. How will the IRB know this is even being used in a study? I'll take that one, Ari. This is Claire. Um, so that's a good question. You know, on the one hand, it's a, it's the responsibility of the sponsor or the researcher to inform the IRB about um, recruitment, how they're going to be recruiting subjects, how they're going to be communicating with subjects during the study. But I, I, again, would encourage an IRB to consider how they can attempt to solicit this information and also to let sponsors and investigators know what what type of information they need in reviewing um, reviewing the use of social media and technology um, when you're recruiting or communicating with subjects. So this could be done, you know, in a number of ways, but um, some ways to address this could be, you know, if you have a handbook for researchers or FAQs on a website, um, something, something that would be um, worth considering developing. Next question is, you mentioned in direct advertising the ads that can appear or pop up on an individual's personal social network page. These ads are generally ta tailored toward the user, meaning that the information was likely co collected by, from that inv individual by a third party through the use of cookies. If my company wants to utilize a third party to help us target appropriate individuals in which to send advertisements, does that third party's collection of information on, on individuals require IRB review? 
Also, is my company supposed to submit with its online advertisements information about how it is going to disseminate the advertisements? Okay. Yeah, I can take this one, Claire. That is definitely a long question. I may have to hear the question again, but hopefully I can take care of this one. So bear with me here. Obviously, there are going to be lots of boundaries to explore with online and social media advertising. So including the good point made with this specific question about the use of third parties and the dissemination of ads. Now, keep in mind that IRB review does extend only so far. With print ads, IRBs did not generally review how researchers intended to find the best newspapers or radio stations or other sources in which to advertise. Instead, IRBs reviewed the advertisement in its medium to determine if the ad was acceptable. So after approval then, the researcher could distribute the ad in its approved form where the researcher thought best. This is somewhat still true now with online and social media advertising, with the big catch now being the collection of information from unknowing persons and also a much more targeted advertising. So I, that's just some general information. Now let me see if I can narrowly answer this question, because obviously this is um, there can be different answers to this question depending on facts you insert or things of that nature. So to attempt to narrowly answer the question, I, I would say if a third party is gathering information on individuals through, let's say, cookies and discovering which IP addresses or visiting certain websites or posting information on certain topics, all in an attempt to find the best audience or individuals in which to advertise, this would likely not require review. The information that people ha have on their computer or share online is public information on the web. So having a third party then use this information to direct clinical trial advertisements to individuals online would not likely require review. Again, it's the advertisement itself that requires review. Additionally, I think you had a second question there. Um, Ari, what was this, the last question? The, the last part of the question was, is my company supposed to submit with its online advertisements information about how it's going to disseminate the advertisements? Okay, I, I would say you do not necessarily need to submit the plan of how you're going to use an approved ad in its approved format, but you could submit this plan if you're not sure or think people may question the ethics of the plan. So the next question is, what if someone is simply asking a question on a web page or blog and the person involved in a study responds? Uh, it looks like a PI or study coordinator response, and then a, perhaps a, a potential subject is visiting a blog and asks if someone knows of a clinical trial, and then perhaps a PI or study coordinator response with specific information for a trial in which they are involved. Okay, I think this was from my section, so I'll, I'll answer this one too. In this instance, it, based on what's described in the question, it does not really sound like the blog contains direct advertising. And again, individuals are free to seek out whatever information they want. The fact that a PI here or study coordinator respond with specific study information would likely not require IRB review, just like if a patient asked their doctor about any available clinical trials. Additionally, remember that OHARP guidance for websites indicates that it is acceptable to provide basic study information without IRB review. However, I would like to add one thing, and that is, let's say the PI or study coordinator respond to the inquiry on the blog and post on the blog or send the inquirer a flyer or let's say a brochure or some sort of advertisement on a clinical trial, this material that's then going to be posted on the blog should receive prior IRB review and approval. Okay, so the next question is, some of the technologies you're talking about are continually updated and it seems like it would be impossible to get IRB review of every tweet or blog post. How is this practical? I can take this one, Mitchell. Um, Mitchell did mention this a little bit in his presentation, but um, you know it is possible. I think that that given a particular plan and perhaps laying out parameters for tweets and blog posts, that you may not um, may not need exact review of the exact content of things. Certainly, you'd want to talk to the IRB that you're working with about what they would need in that circumstance. And that may not be something that um, all IRBs would necessarily be comfortable with. Um, again, you need to work with the IRB that you're, that you're um, using for a particular trial to find an approach to review this technology in advance of trying to implement it. Um, and, um, and, and I think that once those, once those issues are worked out in advance, particularly if you're planning a campaign, you can establish expectations about what requires review, when 
and how that should be submitted and also the timeline in which it can be reviewed. Okay, I think this is probably the last question that we'll have time for. So how, how can people be expected to consent to use, to use social media or other technology when the privacy risks are so wide ranging and may depend on how a person uses the technology themselves? Sure, I can answer that as well. So um, that is a tough, tough question. And, and I think that a lot of the, I mean, some of the privacy risks are unknown um, at this point. We don't, we have some idea of the level of privacy risks. And interestingly, the level of risk, for example, um, with, a, with a social networking page could be um, different based on how the user has their settings set up. So um, the IRB, of course, is expected to describe reasonably foreseeable risks related to participation in research. And that would include perhaps, that, that does include privacy risks and would include a description of the privacy risks that are associated with different uses of technology in the study. Um, it, it's something, I know we here at Quorum have developed standard risk language for various different things that may be involved in a study, and I'm sure certain other IRBs have done this as well. So you may have standard language that you put in a consent form for blood draw risk. Um, you may want to develop standard language that you put in when they're going to be using a text message reminder system. Um, it, it might even be worth it to work with in consultation with individuals who are a little bit more knowledgeable about this type of technology and can really help the IRB to develop um, clear language that does accurately reflect what the privacy risks might be given the use of a particular technology. So um, to the extent you can think about this ahead of time uh, and you're not reinventing the, the wheel every time you come across the use of a particular technology, I would certainly encourage that um, in the consent. And then you can um, put that information into the consent form. So that is all the time that we have for questions. If you submitted a question um, and we didn't get around to answering it, um, just please know that we'll be answering those questions and posting the information to our website. And then as soon as we, we get the information posted, we'll send you a link so that they're available to be viewed. So if you didn't have an opportunity to submit a question during, this, during the webinar, you can submit additional questions uh, either during the survey at the end, or you can email your questions to clientrelations at quorumreview.com. We're going to do our best to follow up individually or answer the questions in the Q&A and then post it to our website. So one way or another, you should receive an answer to the questions that you submit. So just a reminder that the webinar record has been recorded and that the webinar recording, the slide deck, and these Q&A that we've been talking about will be posted to our website. We'll be emailing you all a link to view these items as they become available. And then I, I want to give a plug for the survey that we're going to provide at the end because it does help us to uh, develop more of these webinars that are on topics that are important to you. We had a really emphatic response to this topic, and I believe it's because it really is relevant, and I'd like to continue to provide relevant topics. So please do. It's a very short six-question survey, and if there's other things that you would just would love us to provide more feedback on, uh, we'd love to go forward with that information. And with that, I want to thank you for attending our webinar. I hope that you found this topic inform informative and useful. If you are interested in learning more about Quorum, please visit us at quorumreview.com. And on behalf of everyone here at Quorum, we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much.